Welcome to the Rideshare Guy podcast, where you will learn about the rideshare and mobility industry straight from Harry Campbell, who's got over five years experience covering the industry and has talked to thousands of drivers. There's no better place to stay up to date, entertained, and educated. So let's dive in. So Charlie Zwiebelman was a hedge fund analyst for the past 10 years, primarily investing in internet stocks, including Uber and Lyft. He left the hedge fund world in September and is currently consulting and investing personally, both in the public markets and as an angel investor. So Charlie, I was 90% sure I was going to get your name right, but I think I messed up the last name just a little bit. The pressure was too much when I when it came to reading it. <laughs> Definitely did well enough. Cool. Well, uh, I appreciate you coming on. And, uh, you know, I will say this is an episode that I've wanted to do for a while. And I'll even double down on that and say that this is an episode I should have done a long time ago because now that Uber and Lyft uh, are both public companies, and I think, you know, there'll be many more uh, potentially in the gig economy and the food delivery and other spaces going public in the future. It's something that I think a lot of people, you know, they might know some of the basic terms here and there, but I really don't know anything. And and so I'm hoping by the end of this interview, uh, I, I don't know if I'll need to be as professional as you are, but I'll at least know, be able to know the basics and kind of infer beyond, you know, just the headlines that I'm reading on CNBC. How does that sound? Perfect. All right, cool. Well, uh, you know, I, I read off your kind of quick bio there at the beginning, but uh, is there anything else that you kind of want to add? You know, I think we first got synced up on Twitter and uh, you're, you know, I guess from your tweets and kind of the exchanges we've had, it seems like you're kind of still, you know, constantly looking at a lot of these public stocks and the earnings reports and all that. Is that, you know, kind of how tied in uh, to that world are you these days? Is it more passion, personal or business or, you know, a little of both? Uh, just purely for my own personal investing. So I, I own shares in both Uber and Lyft. So I, I like both stocks. Uh, I guess that I should caveat that's not investment advice. I'm not registered <laughs> or anything like that. Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely less plugged in than I was as of September. But you know, I still follow the companies pretty closely. Mm -hmm. So definitely went through the earnings. Yeah, I keep an updated model. Um, you know, I go through the earnings call in detail. So yeah, interesting. When you say you keep an updated model, what does that mean? Yeah, so I mean, we can, we can get we can get into it um, in more detail, but you know, really every professional institutional investor that covers these stocks will keep detailed models, mm -hmm. which is a projection of you know quarters and out several years in the mm -hmm. future. And you know, the basic way that I value these companies, or really any high growth, especially high growth money losing company, is to go out many years. You know, like you, you can go out to twenty thirty. Mm -hmm. Um, and you're projecting every single metric all the way out there from gross bookings, take rate, you know, adjusted net revenue all the way down through the cost line items down to EBITDA, um, down even further down to EPS. And then I'm figuring out, you know, when I get down to the EPS that far out, you know, what does the penetration look like? How fast is the company going to be growing? What's the quality of the business to try to figure out, you know, at that point what it's going to be worth. And then I'm discounting it back to the present to see, you know, you know, if I'm right on all my assumptions, what is the stock worth or, you know, how much upside is there in the stock? And so, you know, I guess the cumulative of all the analysts that are more participants in the stock doing that is, is basically what drives the stock each and every day. Interesting. Yeah, and I think we'll, uh, we're going to go through a lot of those terms you mentioned. I won't ask you them all at the start to, to define everything at the start, but I think as we go through the, the interview, I'll kind of ask you here and there. So the first one I would be curious to know is EPS. I don't know if I've ever heard that term before. What does that mean? Yeah, you know, maybe because you haven't seen many, I haven't seen much of it from Uber and Lyft or or any of the uh, food delivery companies, but it's earnings per gotcha. share. Okay, so that's why I don't know what so it is. So ultimately... <laughs> Yeah, if you think about a PE ratio, okay. it's price over earnings per share. And so, you know, if you've got a company that's a ten dollar stock, they've got earnings of a dollar, the PE ratio is ten, you know, and then people can compare that ratio to other companies. So, you know, at the end of the day, everybody is projecting things out far out in the future, um, discounting them back. And, you know, I guess that's the basis of a DCF or a, a long form model. It, and then you hear a lot of simplifications of what people do kind of shorthand, whether people look at, you know, multiples of bookings or multiples of revenue. Um, or, you know, multiples of EBITDA a few years out. Gotcha. So it sounds like sort of, and I guess just 
uh, from a more of a curiosity and sort of personal level on your end, it sounds like you're tracking, you know, stocks in general and Uber and Lyft specifically because you're looking for either opportunities or I'm assuming that you're looking for some type of edge over, you know, the public information that's out there. You're trying to get gain some insight that maybe other people don't have so that you can kind of make money um, in the long run. Because I'm assuming this isn't just, you know, you're not just randomly picking 10 stocks and buying them and holding them and tracking them, you know, their performance for fun. I'm assuming you're tracking them because you're seeing something that other people aren't seeing. Is that right? Or what exactly are you looking for? Yeah, I wouldn't describe it as an information advantage. I definitely don't have any information mm -hmm. that anybody else does. I guess it's it's what I think um, or what I do with that information. Gotcha. So we all saw the same earnings report. We all read the same earnings call, and different people can interpret that different ways or things think different things happen in the future. You know, like um, now we get kind of like more into like what are the, the big components of a model or, or what a company is worth. You know, for Uber and Lyft, it's you know how big is the market going to mm -hmm. be? You know, what is the ultimate profitability going to look like? And what is the trajectory to get from where we are to there? You know, how fast does that occur? And so I, I'm, I'm constantly looking for, you know, little data points here or there, whether that's from earnings or, you know, from wherever to try to figure out, you know, are my dots, you know, yeah. kind of plotting along with what I think? Or are they plotting along a little bit below or a little bit above? Yeah. And feel free to stop me if uh, my question questioning <laughs> is getting too invasive in your your own investing and sort of personal uh, history. But, um, you know, I guess so about how many stocks are you tracking these days just generally? Because it seems like, you know, the, the models you're describing for Uber and Lyft seem like a lot of work. So I imagine it can't be in the hundreds. I imagine it's a handful or dozen or dozens, right? Yeah, no, it's, um, uh, you know, maybe detailed like 10, okay. 10, 15. They're all really internet stocks that I've covered for a long gotcha. time. Um, you know, maybe I'll pick up a new one here or there. Um, and if, if something's smaller, you know, I can do a lot less yeah. work. Um, but but I should I should give a pitch um, for, you know, re really sell side research. Mm. You know, there is a place to kind of get started on learning about all these companies. Like, you know, one of the main things I've noticed, I really just joined Twitter in September. And, and one of the main things I've noticed is like, there is a lot of information out there, a, a lot of misperceptions about these companies that can be pretty easily resolved yeah. by, you know, looking at sell side mm -hmm. research. And <laughs> you, you can also, you know, find a baseline model at which to base your projections on. So admittedly, you know, lots of people build their models from scratch. I use a uh, sell side research model and I change the assumptions. Like at the end of the day, for the most part, everybody has the same drivers. It's just kind of like, what do you, what do you think is going to happen? No, nobody has a new metric they're putting in. They're all looking at gross bookings and adjusting that revenue. It's just, what do you think they're going to gotcha. be? What, what are some examples of sell side research companies, just in case anyone wants to dig into those? Yeah, so Morgan Stanley, Deutsche okay. Bank, uh, Barclays, they all have good all internet analysts, ones. UBS. Okay. Got it. Well, yeah. so, you know, talking about some of those mis misperceptions and, you know, I, I really, what I wanted to do on this uh, interview is kind of, you know, first, you know, educate myself since I don't know shit about any of this. <laughs> and second, um, you use the latest Uber earnings um, reports, I guess this would be Q1 of 2020, uh, as sort of a case study, sort of a guide to kind of, you know, I think put real life example to some of these boring terms that I have probably seen many, many times yeah. but never took the five seconds to look them up on Wikipedia. So, you know, I noticed that, for example, like, okay, Uber just released their quarterly earnings. Let's sort of start there. What I saw in the media, a lot of headlines, I would say, almost Almost every single headline that I saw referenced a $2.9 billion loss. And a couple people messaged me about that when I said that I was going to interview you and talked about the fact that the loss isn't really two point or isn't really two point nine billion, and that's not necessarily the number you look at, but it is a pretty catchy headline, right? Uber lost three billion dollars last quarter. I would click on that. Like what the hell happened, right? So how do you feel about that number and kind of let's start there and, and take things from there? Yeah, I mean, it is factually true. There is, you know, a, there are accounting standards and um, they did lose $2.9 billion. The bulk of that loss was a write down of their stakes in Diddy. Um, and I think they also wrote down Grab. And I think they also wrote down their stakes in some of their new mobility or bikes and scooters. Um, so it is factual. I mean, they did lose that amount of money uh, on an accounting basis. I guess the reason that most people are looking through that and you know looking at the you know 600 and whatever million dollar mm -hmm. loss on adjusted EBITDA does that's a better reflection of the ongoing profitability of the operational uh, business sure. so you know hopefully they're not going to write down Diddy's stake again and again and again or, or 
or really we could kind of each put in our own valuation for Diddy and, and their accounting valuation of it doesn't mean a whole lot. But the EBITDA is what the EBITDA is, and that's what we're looking for to see the ongoing trends of the business. Gotcha. So what is EBITDA? So EBITDA, I guess most people are using it as a proxy for cash flow. Okay. Um, and uh, you know that's there's elements of truth and and not truth to that, but um, it stands for earnings before interest, tax, uh, depreciation, and amortization. Okay. Um, so it's earnings before a lot of stuff, but it's it's a standard term across you know the entire market. Uh, so it's not something they created or, or they came up with, and um, you know it, it it probably gives the best look at you know the operational trends of the business. But you know I mean the people are gonna I'm sure attack me or, or just, you know, think otherwise that like, you know, these are real expenses. That's un undoubtedly true. But, you know, the reason that people look at it is it, it's probably giving the best look at the ongoing operational um, side of the gotcha. business. And I mean, I guess the argument against that would be sort of what you said yourself, right? If DD is losing, you know, a billion dollars, if that investment that they made or that equity that they had is losing money consistently over time, then it's sort of, I guess it's outside of the operational costs or, you know, uh, income, but it still is kind of counting against them, right? And I think that, um, you know, but like I think in a, another, maybe another quarter last year when the IPO, I remember that they announced a very high you know, top level loss, but a lot of that was because of stock compensation, which, you know, was maybe going to only happen one time. So it seems like these definitely happen here and there. But what you're saying is that they don't, uh, you know, they aren't a good representation of sort of like the nuts and bolts of like the day to day business of like giving rides and doing food deliveries and things like that. Right. Yeah, I think that's a fair characterization. And with, with the stock-based comp, I mean, stock-based comp is undoubtedly an expense. I mean, that's an, an issue for every single internet and software company out there in the world. Um, Uber's not unique mm -hmm. in that respect. There is an accounting adjustment that happens uh, at the time of IPO, which is why it was abnormally big. Mm -hmm. um, but we probably don't want to get into to a, <laughs> to a uh, deep discussion of stock-based comp because we could have a you know multi-day philosophical philosophical debate about you know whether that should or shouldn't be. Yeah excluded got it so is there anything else uh... from, my, from my perspective yeah i would just say like from my perspective i'm comparing it to everything else out okay. there so like wh whether it ultimately is or isn't you know should be expense shouldn't be expense you know actually whether i should be growing the share count instead and not including it as an expense you know as long as i get the same thing comparably across the entire market to mm -hmm. me that seems Gotcha. Okay. So those were the headlines. And then, you know, we talked about the EBITDA loss, I guess. So it sounds like that's the number. Is it, Do you think that's the number we should be looking at then? That's kind of the number to go off as far as the profitability yeah. of the business? Yeah. Yeah. And then you can kind of break that down between the headline number and then, if, you know, focusing on the ride specific number, and the eat specific number. Um, are also definitely things that I would be doing. Okay. okay. Um, and then let's see. So, you know, I think that uh, obviously the, I, I guess that's kind of the profitability or, or lack of profitability of the business. Is that kind of what that EBITDA number is? Is there anything else we need to know about that? Because I guess the whole, you know, kind of shtick about Uber is that they're not, you know, they're not a profitable company, right? That's kind of like the general, this is a company that's been losing money forever. Um, but, you know, I guess kind of like when I started breaking down the numbers, like on the ride side, they are profitable, it looked like, right? Right. So they, they break out rides profitability, um, separate from eats, separate from self-driving car, separate from other bets. And then they have kind of a, a platform GNA and technology cost line mm -hmm. item. Um, so mm -hmm. on a consolidated basis, they lose money. You know, the bulk of that loss, I guess, is coming from eats. Rides, rides unit economics are positive in that, you know, the entire business of, of rides is making a positive contribution margin. Um, even before you take out, um, well, I guess I should say the, the past two quarters before this quarter, even if you backed out all of the, uh, the, the cost from the general corporate, mm -hmm. the, the GNA and the tech platform R and D the last two quarters, you know, just the rides business could, um, absorb all the costs from the, the general corporate overhead. Um, but I mean, it definitely shows that the unit economics are positive for the business, um, and then I guess this quarter it dipped slightly below that. I think the reality is, you know, some of that GNA and tech platform R&D should be allocated to rides. Some should be eats. And it, you know, I think pretty much whatever way you slice it, um, the rides business is is profitable. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as a percent of GMV, 
what they're looking to make is a very small amount. And, you know, each quarter it's kind of coming in as like a, a, just, you know, I think this quarter total adjusted EBITDA was, you know, negative 4%, a little under negative 4% of GMV. So like they lose on, on aggregate entire adjusted EBITDA a little bit of the entire price customers are paying. And they're looking to make, you know, like 8% over time. Gotcha. What's uh, GMV? So uh, I guess I, I, they call it gross bookings, but just the, the aggregate amount customers gotcha. pay. So, so, you know, if you think about. Yeah. So I, I think, so for example, like in the first quarter of 2020, they said that gross bookings grew to $15.8 billion. That's the number that that's basically all the money that they're taking in from customers. Right. Yeah, that's right. And then what was the other term that you were uh, mentioning off of that? So the, the way that the business model works is um, like, if I have an example over here of like a, a $13 ride, which is probably pretty standard for us ride share um, of that, you know, they, they might take like a, you know, mid twenties cut, something like that. Um, so Uber would take, um, you know, a little over $3. The driver would get a little under $10. Um, there, there'd be some tolls and, yeah. you know, taxes and fees that mixed in there. Um, so the, the, the $13 would be the gross bookings. Mm -hmm. That's what they'd be recording there. The Uber's take would be, um, their adjusted net revenue. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's, that's what they're recording as revenue. So when, when most people talk about margins, they're talking about as a percent of Uber's cut. So as a percent of the 25% that they're taking, you know, how much should they be making from there? And so, you know, they actually break out their take rate. I mean, you could calculate it just as adjusted net revenue of the rides business divided by rides gross mm -hmm. bookings. And they have a presentation where they break it out and, you know, show you, I think it's, you know, it's in the low twenties. Um, and, um, yeah. And, and, you know, from the, you know, call it low to mid twenties, um, take rate that they, that they, that they take in the U S they have to pay from that insurance costs, which are probably a little over a dollar a ride, might be like a dollar twenty. Um, so, I'll, you know, I was saying on a thirteen dollar ride, Uber's getting like a little over three dollars. They're paying a dollar of that just like right out the back yeah. to insurance. Uh, it's, it, you know, it's really just more like a pass through, and then they're paying Visa and Mastercard and the, the payment stack another uh, I don't know thirty nine forty yeah. cents something like that. Um, and so like net each ride Uber left in the U S probably take like a dollar 66, something like that. So like a, a, a real net net take rate of, you know, low teens. Gotcha. So they're taking, yeah. yeah. So I think I'm, I'm looking at the uh, PowerPoint they, they have and on, the, I guess on their adjusted net revenue, they have a 22.8%. Uh, I guess that's a take rate, right. On adjusted net revenue. Yeah. So. Let me see if I can explain this correctly. So 22, this is kind of like, you know, I feel like I'm back in school again. Okay, so <laughs> it's like, Harry, now you need to explain it. Okay, uh, so 22.8% is their take rate. So that's of the, that's basically the percentage that they're taking of the gross bookings, right? Correct. And then of that 22.8%, I guess the amount is $2.475 billion. So that's kind of that percentage turned into dollars. Um, of that, you know, some money is going to insurance, some money is going to Visa and MasterCard, and then they're left with the rest, basically. They're left with the rest. I was calling that kind of like a net net take rate, just to kind of point out that like, you know, a lot of people think that their take rate's high, but really there's a lot of pass through items that kind of bring it down to it. Yeah. Um, at kind of like a low teens rate, which is pretty standard across all 3P marketplaces. Um, and then below that, to get down to this adjusted EBITDA, they're also going to pay, you know, sales yeah. and marketing, which is a huge expense. So I don't know if we'll be able to figure out on this call right now, but I think that, you know, sort of in, in going back to the real life examples, like, you know, when we've looked at it in the past and when drivers, you know, kind of talk about it, they often feel like Uber's taking in that 30 to 40% rate. Um, like 20% seems pretty, I mean, I guess even the commission that they charge drivers is 25%, right? So I guess, how do you reconcile like the amount that, you know, drivers sort of think of as like the driver take rate versus what they're showing here in their financial earnings? I don't know if you know the answer to that, but... I don't know the answer to that. I, I think it, might, it may be a little bit higher in the U.S. because they have higher costs, uh, you know, from insurance and, and payments are a little bit higher in the U.S. than other places. So, you know, it might be more like mid to high 20s. And then depending on how you Uber and Lyft account for the taxes and the tolls yeah. a little bit differently. But like, 
you know, one thing that really gets me about this business is like, you know, almost every day I wake up and there's like, you know, whatever XYZ airport is putting in a $3 mm-hmm. fee. And like that $3 fee has to come from right. somewhere. And like, like my, like the long-term goal of this business is to make a dollar of EBITDA <laughs> per ride. So like there's not $3 to yeah. go. Like, you know, it's going to come, like maybe it comes a little bit out over a lip, but like it's going to come a lot out of the drivers. And so like all those taxes, you know, fees, tolls, et cetera, those are also um, being weighed in there. So I think it's probably a combination yeah. of geographic mix and, um, and a combination and of that. And I guess if all those taxes and tolls and fees are included as part of gross bookings, that sort of means that Uber's percentage, you know, because those are all basically pass-through fees. Like no one really gets, no one good gets any of those. You know, they go straight to the government or straight to the airports, right? So their take rate, you know, like I guess two drivers is actually, it is a little bit higher than that, right? Because they're sort of counting, you know, the, the denominator, I guess you're going to say is, going to be a little bit lower if you ignore all of those taxes and tolls and fees, which really, you know, I think probably would, I, I don't know how big of a percentage they are, but they probably should be ignored if you're thinking of, like if I'm a driver and I guess like if I'm thinking about it, like, okay, a passenger paid $10, Uber took $3 and I got to keep seven. That's sort of typically how drivers are thinking about it. They're, they're not as concerned with like the airport fee. Yeah. I think the other thing we're leaving out is um, just the, the, the driver incentives. Yeah. So the driver incentives are also, you know, whether, you know, I, I guess whether that's a reward or like a sign up referral, a lot of that is coming out of um, the gap between adjusting that revenue and bookings. Yeah. And I did see that uh, I want to say Uber spent $300 million on driver incentives in the last uh, quarter. So Q1. And I feel like I'm curious to know if if something like that, are there any other sort of like little sneaky accounting tricks that you've seen these companies do? Because like something like that seems easy to me where, you know, like a lot of of people on the outside may not realize that, you know, if I'm a driver, like I'm not going to go drive without incentives, you know, without the weekly incentives, like those incentives keep a lot of drivers on the platform. And if they were, you know, like that $300 million a quarter, like if it, you know, starts to decrease in the future, there's definitely going to be, you know, uh, an effect on the marketplace on the driver supply and the number of drivers. So it's, you know, it's sort of to me, I don't know exactly how that's being counted or not counted. I want to say that I saw um, it was kind of ignored in something. I, th- I think they didn't include it in some one of these terms, but no, that's definitely included. Okay. I mean, that's definitely an important component of, of looking at the financial model for Uber and Lyft. I think what, what you might be referring to that was excluded was the one-time payment for relating to coronavirus. Gotcha. And then there was separately, like maybe probably a year ago when they went, went public, they paid a separate, you know, like kind of like a one-time payment to drivers. Payment to drivers. I, I think it was in stock. Yeah. Um, oh, and so that might have been those are kind of like two actually that uh, stock payment to drivers I think which I was that was actually one of the things I, I noted here I was surprised to see that I don't think they ever announced that they paid 300 million dollars to drivers from uh, as part of that driver appreciation program it seems like a lot of money to me yeah you know I guess yeah I mean I, I think it is a lot of money <laughs> But it, you know, at the end of the day, there's a lot of drivers. There's, you know, it's a huge scale pr- platform. Like every one of these numbers, whether we're talking about, you know, d- did they make five hundred and eighty-one million dollars of rides EBITDA, um, or the three hundred million dollars? Like as a percent of the amount that they're taking in, all these are very, very small numbers. Mm-hmm. Which is, you know, for a logistics business, you know, the margins are always going to be low. Yeah. Um, but you know, as a percentage of in aggregate dollars, because the TAM is huge, they can be big numbers. And as a percent of the net revenue that they take in, they can also be big numbers. Yeah. So um, I can go over a couple other uh, things that stood out to me. But I'm, before we get into what stood out to me, since you're the guy who uh, knows <laughs> this stuff a lot better, was there anything else that, you know, so this earnings report came out, maybe you can tell me, like, what do, what do you like quickly look for when an earnings report comes out for a company like Uber and Lyft? I'm assuming, you know, the, the profitability. <laughs> I don't know if that maybe that's that is or isn't the first thing you look at what is the first thing you look for yeah uh, you know so like i don't work at a hedge fund now so it's not as much as a scramble for me but uh, the average hedge fund analyst or i don't know mutual fund analyst is sitting there scrambling and literally updating every line in their mm-hmm. model you know hopefully within like 30 minutes before the call starts um and so they're comparing every single number versus um what they expected versus what consensus expected, which is, you know, I talked about the sell side mm-hmm. analyst, the aggregate of the sell side analyst forms the consensus. Um, and, um, and they're comparing it to companies guidance. 
And I guess the reason that's important is, you know, you can think of companies' guidance. The way I, I think about it is, um, you know, whether a company's on plan or off yeah. plan. Like, you know, do they have a do they have a good grasp for what's going on? And you know, it is a bit of a game. A lot of companies try to, you know, beat by a little bit relative right. to their guidance. But it, you know, it also feels good to, to feel like, okay, things are coming a little bit better than they than they told I us. I mean, I noticed on the PowerPoint um, at one point there was some stat that they were trying to highlight, and it was plus fifty seven percent. And I noticed that they use really big bold fonting for that. And I was like, I guarantee they did that on purpose. <laughs> yeah, interesting. I I didn't notice that, um, but but I'm sure you're right. So, yeah, I mean, so I'm trying to compare, you know, initially the, the flash is just kind of like, you know, what happened versus what I expected and then consensus. And the reason consensus is important is, you know, if the aggregate of all analysts, um, what they think drives the mm -hmm. stock, you know, I don't actually know what every single analyst out there thinks. But if you have like 20, 30 smart guys that are following the stock very closely, kind of like what they think is a pretty good proxy for what everybody mm -hmm. thinks. Um, and so, you know, how does, how did, you know, what happened compared to what we expected? Um, you know, and if, if things are a little bit better, like in the case of Uber this quarter, you know, all the revenue metrics were roughly in line. You know, the gross bookings were roughly in line. The adjusted net revenue was roughly in line. The EBITDA was a little bit better. They didn't lose as much money as people thought. Um, and, you know, there's definitely nuances within that. And we're looking at, you know, Eats gross bookings was better and Ride's gross bookings was worse. And so we're taking all those things and then we're updating our model. You know, you know, if something only is growing you know, for Eats, I don't know, maybe it's it's now growing 30 percent quarter over quarter or something like that. When we thought it was only going to be growing 15. If you extrapolate these things, these things out, the market's going to be much bigger now. They can have big impacts on the stock price. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, you know, kind of. You know, so in, that's kind of the initial flash. And then I'm just trying to, you know, go, getting back to what I talked about before, which is like there's a few main drivers. It's like how big is the business yeah. going to be and what does the ultimate profit really look like? So, you know, in a normal quarter, not with coronavirus, I'm going to be very closely monitoring, you know, this quarter relative to last quarter, did they accelerate by 100 basis points or decelerate by 100 mm -hmm. basis points? You know, and quarter over quarter growth, was it better than last year or worse than last year? Because I'm trying to inform my, my view on, you know, how big is the business going to be and at what trajectory we get there? Um, and, you know, how healthy is the marketplace, especially as we pull back on incentives? Um, and then I'm trying to understand the profitability, which, you know, I, to own the stock and, and me personally, I have a very positive view on what the long term profitability of the business looks like. But I'm definitely every quarter looking for little indicators that can help me figure out if I'm right or wrong. And so, so the main things I'm looking for there are, you know, the most important thing is the competitive environment in my mind. So like every quarter I expect them to tell me like the competitive environment is getting better. Um, and if it's not, you know, that's an issue because, you know, you can flood the market with incentives and profitability can go up in the air, which essentially is what happened prior to Uber's IPO and LATAM, which in my view derailed the IPO. Mm -hmm. um, and then the second thing I'm looking for is just like the, there's some structural component of the unit economics, which we talked about before, which are the insurance and the payments. Like if, if they're able to make progress on how much they're paying out in insurance and payments, like, you know, whether that's passed back to the driver or flows down to them, like that makes big differences in, in how how healthy the business yeah. is. So it sounds like sort of like based off what you said, okay, rides was, I mean, I guess the company kind of did about what uh, analysts expected, maybe even a little better in a couple areas. Rides was kind of down as expected because of coronavirus, you know, hitting in March and eats was up kind of probably as, but I guess a little bit more than was expected because obviously a lot more people staying home. Um, was there anything else that you saw uh, that kind of stood out to you? Yeah, I mean, so yeah, that was within the quarter. If we think about like what really matters is obviously the business got totally derailed mm -hmm. as of you know mid March. Um, they told us they told us they, they had an investor update, a public investor update in mid March where they kind of warned us like rides are probably going to be down eighty yeah. percent. So like we kind of knew the trough was coming. Um, now what they told us at at that point was you know China obviously saw this earlier than. And, and Asia saw this earlier than the U.S., and so they had a little bit of a precedent from Asia and Hong Kong specifically, where they have a business. And they told us that you know Hong Kong initially saw a pretty similar impact to you know I guess the down 80 percent that you should expect to see, and then since then has rebounded to only uh, down 30 percent or 70 percent normal. And so I personally was hoping that 
the down 70, which I'm using as like a, or sorry, down 30 yeah. or 70% of normal. I'm using that as like a lead indicator for what the rest of the you know business might look like. And, and that actually showed no improvement. So, so that was disappointing to me. Um, and then they gave some stats on some cities or some states that have opened up a little bit, which, you know, Georgia and Texas, I think they both said are, you know, roughly 50% off the bottom. But at the end of the day, like if you go down 80 and then up 50, right. you're still at down yeah. 70. <laughs> so, you know, down 70, like up 50, like, not great. Mm, it's not that good. So like, you know, the reality is the rise business sucks mm. and like, you, you know, to own the stock or, to, or, you know, or, or even, you know, I think for the driver ecosystem and, and for all stakeholders, like it's really important that the drive, you know, the rides rebound and, you know, the most important thing, you know, I'll be tracking is just like, what can I, what can I learn to get conviction that, you know, rides are ultimately going to come back and be like they were before. Yeah. And that's a really tough behavioral question to answer. Yeah. Are there other kind of macroeconomic factors happening that you think might affect the stock or the stock price? Like one example would be the fact, you know, there's now 30 million unemployment claims. Like, do you look at something like that and think to yourself, well, that means that, you know, Uber and Lyft, you know, if you're unemployed and you don't have a job or you don't have a car, I can kind of think of one job that makes a lot of sense for someone in that position. Yeah. Do you think about stuff like that? Or how does that even factor oh, into your model too? Definitely. So, um, well, how, I, I don't know that I have a great answer for like how it directly goes into my model. On one hand, like I see lots of, lots of people on Twitter, you know, people in the world that say, you know, as unemployment goes up, as the, as, um, you know, the macro environment gets worse, you know, people aren't going to spend on eats, right. you know, they're not going to spend on ride share, they'll drive their own cars or whatnot. Um, there actually is a precedent like Brazil was in recession, I think through 2016 where Uber operated. In fact, lots of consumer internet companies operated and they all did pretty well. You know, Brazil, you know, Brazil or Latam as a whole was a great market for Uber until Diddy entered. It wasn't really a, an economic issue. And then to your point and Lyft mentioned this on their call is, you know, driver signups, I think are through the roof. Um, now they've, they've had to pause new driver signups because they don't have the demand. But I think it's an interesting shift and one that's really important for the regulatory debate or um, is, you know, like, you know, a lot of plenty of people are bearish on the stock because AB5 and the potential for everybody to become employees. But, you know, that was in a, well, I don't know what our unemployment rate was, 3%, yeah. whatever. We were in a very tight labor market. Now there's going to be so many more people looking for their job and they might be looking to ride share for that job. But the number of people looking for jobs, um, I, I would say Uber and Lyft could have a big impact on people being able to get jobs when they're otherwise unemployed. Um, and like undoubtedly, you know, I'm trying to take as much you know bias out of this as possible. Like if, if they're employees, they're going to be shifted and they're not going to be needed as much. And so there's going to be fewer job opportunities. And so, you know, I, I think that the regulatory debate and one of the main bear points on the, on the stock might shift as a result of, the unemployment market. Gotcha. So you're sort of saying that, you know, when or if and when there are a lot of unemployed people, it's sort of better to have more job opportunities available as independent contractors versus if they were to hire all employees, there would sort of be less jobs available for fewer people. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, listen, I might come on in a few <laughs> years and tell you like, wow, I was a huge idiot. But, you know, you know, the interesting thing about the hedge fund world is, you know, you're taught very early to like take out any political bias or anything because like you're not going to make money right. being politically biased. So, you know, consulting studies exist that talked about, you know, if we move to an employment model, the number of, you know, drivers that Uber and Lyft would need would probably be down like 75%. Yeah. Like it's a very material uh, impact. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think that that's going to be in regulate, you know, regulators interest, you know, at a time when unemployment is skyrocketing, people are losing their jobs left and right. Like, do you want to knock out 75% of the Uber Lyft workforce? And, yeah. you know, maybe those numbers are wrong, but like, that's what I've been yeah. showing. And so I think this is a, a good transition point to some of the questions that you wanted to actually ask me, but I, I guess I'll, I'll sort of also leave, I'll, I'll leave you with one final thought and then you can kind of take over. I know you have a few questions to ask me. Um, and I guess, 
I, I, I'm still kind of curious to know how some of these, you know, like, okay, so AB5 is a good example where it could have a pretty big material effect on the business and probably, you know, people's opinions of the stock price and things like that. Um, so how do you sort of you, I mean, is it just kind of like you have to make your best guess or sort of you want to know like the latest and greatest that's happening in that debate? Let's say it's AB5 so that you can be kind of one of the first people to know like, oh shit, it's looking like drivers are going to be employees. I need to update, you know, my model or change this or change my assumptions like what's sort of the point of you know like very closely following the ab ab5 debate for someone like you right now yeah for someone like me not a lot because i'm, I'm out of the i'm out of the hedge fund game but um as a, as a hedge fund analyst i think it's safe to say that people will pay you know consultants to hear their views on what will happen mm -hmm. and those might be lobbyists, uh, you know, we'll definitely ask Uber and Lyft their views, you know, anybody we can get a hold of. And, you know, the job of the analyst is to make a judgment on what's going to happen. And, you know, given that, given that judgment on what's going to happen, what does that mean for the stock? Um, and those are, those are different questions. Um, but it's, it's undoubtedly a risk and a, a major, you know, focus point for everybody. Yeah. And I guess I, I will say I'm one of those people that have been called since I do. Uh, <laughs> I've done quite a few yeah. uh, calls with analysts over the past year. I mean, usually they're pretty casual, you know, consulting type calls one hour. I've got a few guys that like call me every month or two. And it's very, very chill, very easy for me because it's stuff that's right up my wheelhouse. And I really, you know, I sort of like you said, I try to take my bias out of it and just give them the information and let them make the decisions. But I, I really don't know a whole lot of what happens once I give them the information. So I'm always curious and I've, I've been too shy to ask. But uh, that's why it was funny when you mentioned that you had a few questions for me, because a lot of the questions that you asked me are the ones that I kind of answer all the time for a lot of analysts. So I think with that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it over to you for a few questions and then uh, I'll let you get out of here. Yeah, I mean, you know, undoubtedly the health of the ecosystem and having a healthy driver network, having, you know, satisfied drivers making enough mm -hmm. money is critically important to the stock. And, you know, there's, you know, talking about sell side analysts, there's people that do surveys or even, you know, you know, uh, you know, hedge funds that will pay to do surveys. And we're trying to understand that, but I figured you'd be in a good person, a good person to just kind of hear some views in terms of, you know, what you hear um, from drivers. Like, you know, maybe we'll start with like, what are the key asks from drivers these days? Like, what are they looking for that they're not yeah. getting? Well, and I think it's a little interesting too now in times of COVID because that's sort of shifted a lot of what drivers care about. You know, right now, there's not a whole lot of rides to go around, um, you know, kind of as we talked about. So I think right now, drivers are really just focused on like getting unemployment and sort of figuring out, you know, the whole maze of navigating the federal government, you know, PUA system and unemployment insurance and things like that. And I don't think they're actually counting on Uber and Lyft for a whole lot, but sort of pre-COVID and probably as things get more back to normal, I think just generally drivers, you know, it's funny, like a lot of times uh, the, you know, you know, people ask me this question is like what drivers care about. And it's like a very simple answer. It's money. They just want to make more. <laughs> you know, I think like, you know, making money is not unique to being an Uber Lyft driver. I think everybody cares about income, making more, um, you know, making more money, you know, kind of like growing uh, their income and things like that. And while there are some unique aspects of the driver, driving jobs, you know, like the flexibility, like you can log on, log, log off whenever you want and drive whenever and wherever. Of course, you know, there's certain strategies you want to use to make the most amount of money. I think that part is unique, but the sort of, you know, the, the thing that unites everyone, whether you want to be an employee or independent contractor is that you want to make more money, right? Employees, you know, may want additional healthcare, um, you know, independent contractors might want to make more money, but I think every single driver, if you ask them, like, would you like to make more per mile? They would all say yes, 100%. <laughs> maybe 99%. So I think that's kind of number one. And then from there, you know, I think it actually, you know, there's a few things that all drivers care about. And that's sort of why I have not been like a full, you know, I actually, I guess, you know, in the past, if you asked me if I supported drivers being employees, I said no, um, because I think that there's more things that all drivers care about. You know, employees, you get health insurance, you get overtime, you get a lot of benefits, but it's not something that every driver cares about. I think that every driver cares about getting paid more, not being unfairly deactivated because the deactivation process with Uber and Lyft is really 
really sketchy, if you ask me. Um, you know, the rating system is kind of a mess. Uh, you know, you're kind of like a lot of drivers have a lot of anxiety over ratings, even though, frankly, like most drivers are never going to be deactivated and don't have to worry about it. But, you know, it's it, it's anxiety inducing <laughs> to, you know, not know what you right. did wrong and your driving career, you know, kind of hinges on some drunk 23 year old guy, right? <laughs> Taking a ride. So, you know, I right. think there's things like that that all drivers do care about. Yeah, that's super helpful. So, like, you know, what's your overall impression, I guess, for, for the market, you know, drivers as a whole? I guess it's hard to say during coronavirus, but, you know, pre coronavirus, like, how do you think, you know, what's the best way to phrase this? Like, you know, how did you, how do you think, like, the, the ride share um, independent contractor position, you know, was? for drivers and then like maybe separately, like for the guys that are doing really well, like there must be some yeah. outliers that are making a lot of money. Like, you know, is that the case? And you know, how much, what's the potential? Yeah, so I think definitely pre coronavirus, you had a lot of drivers who, you know, frankly, I think that it's like any job, you know, if you're doing something 40, 50, 60 hours a week, it kind of starts to suck. You know, it's not fun working a lot of hours in a lot of jobs, you know? And so Uber and Lyft are not unique to that. And I think that if anything, you know, driving for Uber and Lyft 40, 50 hours a week is very, very tough on your body physically, mentally, and even income wise, because if you're only driving 5, 10, 15, 20 hours a week, then you have the ability to number one, kind of strategize to only, let's say you only want to drive Friday, Saturday nights, and that's, you know, where you can make the most amount of money. Or let's say that you can only drive because of your schedule, you know, during the afternoons from two to six, and then you have to go and pick up your kids. That might not be the times where you can maximize your income, but it's literally the only job you could find during that time. So in that sense, it's extremely valuable to you. And so the more hours you put in, though, the less you get to take advantage of the flexibility, the less you get to take advantage of the higher income earning hours. And so frankly, you know, as you start getting into the 30, 40, 50 hours a week, I think the job becomes less and less appealing. And I think that's why you see, you know, frankly, if you're driving 40 hours a week for Uber, you're sort of driving like an employee, but without any of the benefits. You kind of know that, okay, I have to drive Monday through Friday, rush hour, you know, AM commute and PM commute, because that's when it's busy. I probably have to drive Friday, Saturday night, um, and, you know, kind of fill in the hours between. So even though you can, you know, you still have some flexibility to take a day off here and there, but you're going to have to make it up, right? Because you don't get sick pay. Uh, you don't get any type of vacation or anything like that. So you can sort of just see, I think the more hours you put in, kind of the worse the job gets from the driver's perspective. And there are definitely outliers, you know, and I think if anything, like one of the criticisms of my side is that maybe we try to, I wouldn't say sugarcoat it, but highlight the outliers because I'm just my personal opinion and in building this business is if, you know, I'm not trying to tell people that they shouldn't drive for Uber and Lyft. That would be like a pretty stupid business to run. It's like, hey, you know, I'm going <laughs> to do all this content about why you shouldn't drive for Uber and Lyft. People watch my videos and then they never come back, right? So I think that my approach has always been that I'm not going to make a judgment whether you should do it or not. But if you do want to drive for Uber or Lyft, I'm going to tell you the best ways to do it. You know, like making $10 an hour, that might suck for a lot of people, but for others, that's all they need to make. And so, you know, most drivers are making $15 to $20 an hour before for expenses pre-coronavirus, and there are definitely outliers. So if you're driving in a top city like San Francisco or LA, you know, kind of based on population, there's a ton of driver incentives. There's a ton of demand, especially in a place like San Francisco. Of course, cost of living is a little higher, so you have to factor that in, but I think it more than, you know, the, the upside more than outweighs the downside. And, you know, just really unlike a lot of jobs and kind of one of the things that I have always found attractive and why I'm like kind of very passionate about this line of work is that in you know a small way you are rewarded for not only your effort but also your strategy um, and that's really what my whole site is about you're not going to be able to make five times more than some other new driver but you can definitely make five dollars an hour more you can definitely make ten dollars an hour more um, and there's definitely opportunity to kind of outperform and you know kind of work smarter than other drivers so that's sort of uh, you know how we think about the earnings right that's super helpful so that kind of dovetails into probably my last question, which is just, you know, your your thoughts on AB5 slash the employee debate and just, you know, what do you think is best for them? And then maybe what do you think ultimately happens? Best for drivers or best for Uber and Lyft? Yeah, best for 
best for drivers? Yeah, I think what's best for drivers is, I mean, it really kind of depends on the camp that you're in, right? If you're a full-time driver, I think there's no doubt. And that and that's sort of where I've tried to shift a lot of the conversation in AB5 is understand like there are winners and losers in this. It's not, you know, everyone's going to get rich and you know smell the roses when all is said and done. There's going to be trade-offs. Maybe maybe trade-offs is a, is a better word than winners and losers. And I think that frankly, you know, full-time drivers, like they would be big winners. Um, in becoming employees uh, for the most part. You know, I think that maybe it won't work out exactly, you know, the way they're hoping. Maybe Uber, you know, won't let them work 30 hours a week so that they don't have to pay health care or won't let them go over 40 so that they don't have to pay overtime, which is, you know, 150 or time and a half in California. There's some weird little caveats like that. But I do think for the most part, it will, it will be better for those drivers who are full-time, um, you know, doing 40, 50 hours a week. And I think for the part-time drivers, the ones like, you know, let's say take someone like me who, you know, I'll go out occasionally, I'll drive a few hours here and there. I'm like a terrible employee to Uber and Lyft. Like, they probably hate me, you know, like imagine if I, you know, if they had to try and schedule this guy who works like once every month, you know, once a month or wants to work 10 hours one week and zero hours the next. Like if you've ever hired anyone, that's a total nightmare um, and makes things really challenging. So I think that uh, there's definitely, you know, some downsides to becoming employees. But at the same time, you know, you kind of have to understand the trade offs like New York City. I know we talked about is a good example where they instituted a minimum pay. And that's one component of becoming an employee. There's a whole lot of other benefits that you would get. But minimum wage basically is one component. And the way they did it in New York City was pretty smart. Um, but the trade off is that now you can't log on whenever and wherever you want. And in my opinion, I think that's fair. Um, a lot of drivers don't like that system in New York City because they're locked out. But I mean, if you kind of ask for the ability to be paid a guaranteed minimum wage, you shouldn't be logging on on a Tuesday afternoon at 3 p.m. out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> where you're not going to be making any money anyways. And that's really what my whole site is about. It's about right. teaching drivers not to do those actions like that. So it's sort of almost like, you know, with the minimum wage, it's forcing you to go into these, you know, certain areas. And I think that benefits a lot of drivers. It benefits a lot of new drivers who hop onto the platform and don't really know what they're doing. And, you know, might be like, this job sucks. I only made $5 an hour. It's because you weren't doing the right things. Um, and so I think that, you know, kind of, I'm sort of answering your question in a long winded way, but generally, uh, like. you know, sort of, so sort of with AB5, like, I don't think the trade offs of every driver becoming an employee are worth it. I think it'll benefit. I mean, if you look at it mathematically, like it will benefit, you know, if you kind of agree with me that full time drivers will benefit more than part time, like mathematically, 15 to 20% of drivers are full time. So, you know, those drivers will see a lot of benefit, but 80% of drivers won't. So, so it's kind of hard to argue with the math in that sense um, that drivers won't benefit because I still like I said earlier I, I think there are two or three or four or five things that all drivers care about and that's more what I would like to see I think that you know maybe to end on things like one of my I, I don't know how feasible this is sort of with the legal structures now and the ABC tests and all of that but like I think you know I've worked at many businesses where they hired employees and they've also hired independent contractors for the same job um, and you know the employees kind of got paid less on a you know sort of hourly basis but their employment was more stable they got more benefits right and the independent contractors could be fired at will <laughs> or you know fired very easily and so I think that you know I don't, I'm not sold on the fact that you know there needs to be this compromise or this hybrid or you know uh, employees or even independent contractors but uh, I don't know I'm, I'm, the more and more you know it's, it's, I'm sure it'll keep evolving but the more and more I think about it it does seem like hey you know if, if you could become an employee driver great but if you could also stay independent that seems like it might be benefit still a large, larger number of people. Right. Yeah, that's super helpful. Yeah. I mean, if New York is the most employee like market and the, you know, it's the market where that makes the most sense because it has a disproportionate relative you know, number of full time drivers relative to the other yeah. market. But yeah, I've, I've seen plenty of negative feedback on the New York market and drivers being locked out. Um, an interesting point on that is there was this report from Barclays um, maybe like late last year about kind of like what happens with regulations in general um, and, and the taxi regulations. And you know, one of the direct um, problems with that is that it incentivizes you. If you have to pay a minimum wage, I mean, for one, you have to lock out drivers, yeah. or you know, they can only drive on one app. But another part is like you know, the service levels in the outer boroughs are hurt. Yeah. 
they're hurt because the density isn't there and the, the, and the you know as they have to raise the prices you know it's harder for them to pay so mobility in the outer boroughs is hurt yeah. so there's definitely a couple flip sides of that I mean, it's definitely but it's, I would say it's a very nuanced discussion right and that's sort of what I, I'm trying to always tell people it's not so simple as let's make employees and everything there's gonna be like second order effects even like you know if, if you're looking at the current system with independent contractors right if uber and Lyft are offering lots of driver incentives right now they're typically gonna do you know the higher socioeconomic areas because that's where all the rides are like they're not gonna be incentivizing drivers to go to the outer boroughs right so you're sort of like right now you're kind of like shifting a like the companies are sort of shifting a lot of the risk or liability onto the drivers who you know you pick someone up and you don't necessarily like want to not do that trip like it's kind of a dick move to say like hey I can't take you to the outer borough right now because I'm not gonna get a return trip and uber doesn't pay me enough the drivers who you know we've done some content sort of tells drivers like hey this is a strategy <laughs> we're not saying you should do it or not but um, you know this is something if you're trying to maximize your income that's what you would do and I guarantee that if uber and Lyft you know sort of had to take that financial risk or liability then they would really start thinking about and kind of weighing those decisions you know on kind of like a much higher uh, level than like that where the individual driver that's kind of hard for them to say no but at a high level you know like you said you're probably right uber would probably say hey we're not going to do those trips anymore we're not going to kind of allow for those because it costs us too much money right so i, I would say what i'm betting on and, and what you have to bet on as an Uber investor is you have to think that the drivers are gonna succeed along with Uber. And so the, the two or the main way that I see that happening is just the number of trips per hour going mm -hmm. up. Um, and so you know they, they pretty much said their take rate is remaining relatively stable. Um, and so I think the business is gonna grow pretty materially over the next five years. Um, and so if I think that the, the number of trips is gonna go up, hopefully the density increases, the number of trips per hour can go up. And Uber, you know, like I said, is, you know, their goal is to make a dollar per ride. Like it's not some heroic mm -hmm. huge amount. There's not two dollars of taxes and fees and whatever for yeah. them to take out of their profit. Like the business model won't work that way. And so, you know, there needs to be a push to, you know, get more rides per hour. But separately, like every one of these taxes and tolls from like whatever airport, yeah. like there's not two dollars to come out of Uber's pocket, and so like if there can be anything, you know, the drivers need to succeed for Uber stock to succeed, and and you um, you can't keep taxing yeah. and whatnot on them every you know two dollars here two dollars there there's there's not that money to go around yeah no it seems like uh i i think they're <laughs> i think the financials you know a lot of people focus on the top line number like uber has nine billion dollars in cash they must be a rich company um and so a lot of the airports you know oh, what's two dollars but i think you're you're right this is a you know i mean i guess logistics and transportation like you said is has traditionally been a very low margin business so it'll be interesting to see uh you know if, I, I think a lot of cities are are actually trending and you know let's tax uber and lift more <laughs> going forward. So we'll see what happens in the future. Uh, Charlie, really appreciate you uh, coming on and uh, walking through this uh, earnings report. We'll have to do it again sometime in the future when there's some uh, new developments, which uh, I'm sure won't be too long. If, if people want to uh, follow you on Twitter or kind of maybe even learn a little bit more about what uh, you do, is there a good spot they should go? Um, no, no website or anything like that, but they can definitely follow me on Twitter, you know, as long as they're supporters and if they're, if they're not, I guess I can block it. <laughs> well, I think, uh, definitely appreciate all the, uh, information you put out on Twitter and uh, we'll leave a link to your profile in the show notes if people want to get a hold of you. Uh, thank you very much, Charlie. Perfect. Thanks a lot. Bye.